Good morning. Thank you for joining me for another five good minutes with the word. I'm Barry Bryson, and we're continuing our study of um, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and I will make good on my promise of yesterday. <laughs> and we will talk about the Mount of Transfiguration. We're in chapter 9, verse 2, and we're going to read through verse 13. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and brought them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them, along with Moses, and they were conversing with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, because he didn't know what to answer, because they had become terrified. Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And all at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus only. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man should rise from the dead. And they seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead might mean. And they began questioning him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first and restore everything. And yet, how is it written the Son of Man, of the Son of Man, that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did send, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it was written of him. Okay, um, well, this is such a visually vivid uh, account, and 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 I know that we have all imagined it. In, in our mind's eye, um, he still seems to be north um, in, in Gentile country, up around the, the source of, the, of Jerusalem, I mean, the Jordan River, excuse me. And if that is the case, the mountain is probably Mount Hermon, which was at the time and continues to be, at least for a while, uh, snow-capped. Um, the snows on Mount Hermon help feed uh, the Jordan River. And, and um, so in his Jesus day, he would have had a very prominent snow, it would have been a very prominent snowy peak. And this could have happened in the snow. So that's an interesting thing to think about as well. He was metamorphosed. He went through a metamorphosis. He was transformed before them. Um, and his garments became white, ra radiantly white, radiating light, evidently. Uh, it, it's probably beyond what we can visually imagine. Um, and and, um, and, and because of the way language is strained to describe it. And Moses and Elijah are there. There are so many reasons why Moses and Elijah. The big reason, law and prophets. Moses is the lawgiver. Elijah is the first of many prophets. And the law and the prophets are there with Jesus. But there are so many connections. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus have all three fasted for 40 days and been sustained by God during that time. Moses and, and Elijah both had an unusual uh, death or passing from this life to the next. Moses died naturally, uh, but God was the one with him and God buried him on Mount Nebo and God was the one that was there to witness his death. Elijah did not die, but was taken into heaven in a chariot uh, and, and they were with a, with a whirlwind of fire. And of course, Jesus in the grave, his death, burial, and resurrection, you know, they all had those unique circumstances. And that just scratches the surface of the, um, of the, of the, 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 the uh, appropriateness of Moses and Elijah being there. They're talking to Jesus. I think this whole thing is so, um, um, moving when we think about how important it is for Jesus, who's about to turn his face to Jerusalem, um, to, to, to have conversation 
with these two men who knew something of the burden Jesus was carrying because they shouldered it themselves in, in a solitary way, the way Jesus did. Um, for Jesus to have a moment, an all too brief a moment, um, in a sense, home again, um, in a sense, to enjoy something of um, who he is or was, and in a way would never fully be again when he was God and God alone. Now he's God fully and he's us fully. And so we don't think about this, but the Bible makes it clear. Jesus himself was permanently altered by his experience in that he has a body now. And he's just as much us as he is God. Um, how important was this for him going forward? I would think very important for him going forward. And this moment, this miraculous, amazing moment. And how did they know it was Moses and Elijah? They didn't need photographs, but they did. And I think that's because there are no strangers in heaven. When we, when we are our eternal selves, we are fully known, even as, as, um, as we're known by our friends now. Um, and the spell is broken because Peter opens up his yap and says something completely inappropriate. Um, and, and the great detail in Mark's gospel, and this is one of the reasons why I think Peter's preaching and storytelling is probably a main source of this gospel. We, you know, we get this detail we don't get anywhere else. Peter says he, he didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to think. They were just so afraid, and it came out. Um, and he says, teacher, not Messiah, teacher. We're so blessed to be here. Let's, let's build three booths so that we can honor Moses and Elijah and you. And God speaks. And we have, you know, Mount Sinai experience at this point. God, God's voice from the cloud. And God speaking directly to a human being, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And uh, then the moment is gone. And they look up and it's just Jesus there, the Jesus that they've known for these past years. And, uh, and Jesus is, is um, telling them, don't tell anyone this until after I have raised from the dead. And in all this, the thing that puzzles them is the raising of the, from the dead. And then they talk about Elijah coming. And I think probably they're thinking, did, did we just see a resurrected Elijah? Uh, one of the cool things about Moses and Elijah both being there is that we, we are told in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, the Messiah will be a prophet like Moses. And in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, that before the Messiah comes, Elijah will be there to prepare the way. And, and that's, they, they remember that verse. So both Moses and Elijah are necessary preliminary figures to the coming of the Messiah, and they're there with him. And they want to talk about this. And Jesus said, okay, but have you pondered what it means that I'm going to suffer and die? Um, and then he says, yeah, Elijah did come. And although it's a bit cryptic, he doesn't explicitly say he's talking about John the Baptist. It's clear that he is talking about John the Baptist as being the one who fulfilled that prophecy in Malachi that, that Elijah would come. And of course, when we talked about John the Baptist, we talked about all the parallels between the two men, visually even, between the two men. Okay, I've taken nine minutes of your time. Thank you so much for joining me for another five good minutes. <clears throat>